Welcome to the Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show, a real estate investment program. Listen and learn how to use real estate to build wealth and passive income streams for you and your family. We bring you experts every day to discuss and answer your questions on everything from single family homes all the way up to 600 plus unit apartment complexes. And now, the Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show. Welcome to the show. My name is Al Gordon, and as always, I'm working on your financial freedom. And get this, there was a report that was published in March of 2022 by Zillow. You you guys have heard of Zillow, right? I'm, I'm always talking about Zillow on this show. They do a lot of research. They do spend a lot of money analyzing the real estate markets. They, they do a pretty good job of collecting all that data and pushing it out there. Where, where I have a problem with Zillow is when they decide that they're going to try and monopolize a market. That's, that's when I have a problem with them. Or when they decide that real estate is global and not local. Then I have a problem with Zillow. But, but other than that, most of the research that these guys do is, is pretty good research. They, they actually have a pretty solid research team that produces information that people like you and I can use. So I'm going to use it today. And here's what they said. Zillow reported that the typical United States home appreciated more in 2021 than the median annual salary paid to the average American employee. Yeah, that's what they said. Now, that's a lot of big words. It really is. It's a lot of big words to basically say this. On average... Homes across the United States, single family homes on average. I'm not, I'm not saying little tiny two bedroom, one bedrooms only. I'm not saying massive Beverly Hills mansions only. I'm saying everything. Average it all together. The average price, according to Zillow, increased almost $53,000. They said $52,667. When they compared that to the median pre-tax income for the average United States worker. Now, median is half the people make above, the other half make below. That's what the median is, right in the middle. $50,000. $50,000. Now, this is pretty amazing. Now, it doesn't mean that every property out there went up $52,000. It, it doesn't mean that. It's, it's a statistical analysis of what the markets are doing. But when's the last time you heard a report that said real estate made more money than you going to work? I, I don't remember hearing a report like that ever in my life. I'm, I'm kind of older, I suppose. I don't know. I guess I'm still kind of young, too. I'm 58. Okay, I'm not quite 58. I got another week. I'll be 58 and six days. But having said that, this is amazing. This is absolutely amazing because what we have always been taught, you were taught this. I was taught this. The founder of Lifestyles Unlimited, Del Wamsley, he was taught this. The 50,000 members of Lifestyles Unlimited, we were all taught this one thing, that to be successful in life, the way to achieve success, the way to achieve wealth, the way to get ahead, the way to get to this life that you've always wanted is to focus in school. Do well in school. When you get done with school, you get into the workplace. And if you've done very well in school, that will translate into you getting an even better job than anybody else would get. And whatever job you got, you did everything you could. You poured your time, your talent, your heart, your, 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 your soul, literally your soul into that job. You give it everything. You put 40, 50, 60 hours, whatever the, whatever the job requires into that job. And then when you're, you're done contributing all of that time and all the mental resources 
Not to mention whatever you pulled out of your own pocket to help your employer out, because that happens too. They, in turn, are going to give you a salary. And if things are going really well, I mean, really, really well, and you got that really, really great job, better job than anybody else got, you probably got a retirement plan with it. Maybe you got a pension. Oh, they don't make those anymore. Chances are you didn't get a pension. But chances are they signed you up for something called a 401k. And and they may even said, hey, look, here, we're actually going to throw some money at that 401k for you. You put money in, we'll put money in. And we'll all call it your money. And you're thinking, wow, this is how this works. This is how it works. This is how I become ultra wealthy. And all I have to do is do this for 30, 40, or 50 years. Hopefully never lose my job along the way. Hopefully never get laid off. Hopefully never have a medical emergency where I can't work. Hopefully never have to go on disability. Hopefully everything in my life is going to be perfect over the next 30, 40, or 50 years. And when I get to the end of this road, I'll have this massive, massive bag of money. It'll be a never-ending bag of money that I'll live off of and I'll be able to take cruises and I'll have a beautiful mansion to live in and I'll have all kinds of beautiful cars and I'll have a yacht and all this stuff. It's a pipe dream. All that stuff's a pipe dream. Yeah, that's the stuff the financial services industry pumps out every year to make you think that doing all of that stuff is the way to go. They spend massive amounts of money on advertising to get you to understand that that's the way to success in life. And it's a, a load of bricks. It's a load of garbage. It's okay. I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop right there. Cause you know where I'm going, right? You know exactly where I'm going. It could completely destroy your life doing that stuff. And look, Zillow just said, average home prices beat the median salary. So maybe what you've been doing, maybe it's not so smart. We come back from the break. I'll fill you in on the insider information. Stick around. Welcome back to the Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show. Now, let's get back to your map to financial freedom. Welcome back to the show. All right, let's get into this. Let's, let's talk about the fact that in 2021, Zillow Research determined that the average United States home appreciated by almost $53,000. And in comparison, the median pre-tax income for a United States household is only $50,000. Are you beginning to start to understand that some of these things that we have been told in our lives may not necessarily be true? They may not be completely true. Now, they may have a lot of truth to them. A lot of truth. I'm not, I am not calling out the entire financial services industry and calling them liars. I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. I think they tell the truth. I think they do. Everything that they say they're going to do for you, they they usually do. To include getting you maybe a seven, eight, nine, possibly a 10% return on your investment. When you have your money sitting in those 401ks or IRAs or in your, where have you, where have you got your money? I think that's true. But when you do the math and you start to realize that if you start with a certain amount of money, let's, let's call it a thousand dollars. Shall we? You've got a thousand bucks laying there. You're going to invest it. Pretty simple, right? Okay. So you invested the thousand dollars. A year later, your financial planner, let's say they made you 10%. You've got $1,100 in that account. Okay, you made 10%. That $100 you made, 
that's not really helping you. All it's doing is it's, it's staying in that account. Now, it's going to allow you to buy additional fractional shares, but you're not allowed to take that $100 that you made in distributions because you're not allowed to take distributions from those retirement accounts. See, one of the things the government decided on your behalf when they created this whole 401k thing back in 1978 was that they needed to make sure that you did not have any access to your money. That's correct. The government believes, at least they did in 1978, they probably still believe it today, the government believes that you don't know what you're doing, that you need to have a financial services company managing your money for you because you're not smart enough to do it. Now, I don't, I don't think if you get into the 401k legislation documents, you know, the law, all that stuff that's out there in the Federal Register, wherever they publish all that stuff, you're going to find exactly what I said in there. there there's nothing in there that says the government thinks you're, you're not smart enough. But really, that's what the government thinks. See, the government has to dumb things down. They do. They have to dumb things down. In other words, everything has to be a one-size-fits-all because that's the way the government tries to resolve things in this country. Even though all, what, 330 million of us are all unique and completely different, right? We're all unique and completely different. But the government's got to figure out a way to apply a retirement system to all 330 million of us. Okay, back in 78, I don't think there were that many people. But you know where I'm going, right? So as a result of that, you, you tend to get these, these kind of watered-down versions of something that could have been really great, but because the government got involved and because special interest gets involved and then political parties get involved and then other political interests get involved. You see where I'm going, right? You know exactly where I'm going. You wind up with something called the 401k legislation that basically allowed corporate America to step away from pensions, which were destroying them financially. Yeah, Pensions are very expensive to maintain because you think about what a pension is. It's a promise to pay somebody who did work for you, who no longer works for you, no longer provides anything of value to you, but you still endure the cost of that employee. Yeah, expensive, very expensive. Part of the reason why the military no longer offers a pension They've gone to their own version of the 401k. Now, they call it a TSP, a Thrift Savings Program. And I remember, I remember when they rolled this thing back out, out back in, I don't know, it was the early 2000s. And, but you didn't get any matching funds, did you, when you're on active duty? No, there was no matching funds. You basically, all that TSP said was you have a dedicated account that you could put money into, right? And the money stays there until you draw it out. Yeah, and the, and the same penalties apply. Yeah, the whole 10% penalty if you're not old enough, right? Okay, and when you take the money out, you're going to pay taxes. Okay, same stuff. But it saved the Department of Defense billions of dollars in future costs by migrating away from a pension system to the TSP system. Kind of interesting, isn't it? Same benefit for corporate America. Once they realized in 1980 that the legislation had gone into place in 1978 that created this whole mess, once, once they realized that that was a huge cash savings to the corporate bottom line, yeah, they, couldn't, they couldn't get out of their own way to make these plans available to their employees, to wean people off a pension and onto a 401k. I, I'm sure there are organizations out there that made some kind of real attractive deal for you to give up your pension and take on this 401k. And here's the problem. All that money just sits there. It just sits there. It does nothing for you. Okay. It grows. Not always. Sometimes it goes down, doesn't it? You know that to be true. But it's supposed to grow. 
All right, let me get back to the houses here. The fact that the average house went up $53,000. Now, I'm not suggesting that every house in America went up $53,000. That would be ridiculous because that's not the way it works. But when you think about the fact that there's a lot of real estate in the United States, there are a lot of single family homes in the United States. And if every one of those homes went up by, let's just say, almost $53,000, that's a huge, huge, huge increase in wealth in the United States. I mean, think about it. It's a lot of money, right? Let me, let me put it in a different perspective for you. I was talking with Andy Webb before the show. Now, you know Andy because he's, he's one of the Lifestyles Unlimited real estate investor radio show hosts. He, he does one of these shows for us. And I was talking to him about his 16 houses. I'll tell you what. When we come back from the break, I'm going to fill you in on what Andy told me about his 16 houses. It's going to blow your socks off. Stick around. Listening to the Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show will change your life. We will teach you how to create wealth and passive income so you can be financially free. And now, back to your host. Welcome back to the show. All right, while we were at break, I was doing some statistical analysis for you. Yeah, I was doing some statistical analysis analysis for you. I had to say it twice because it's hard for me to say it the first time, so I wanted to make sure I could do it twice. Statista. That's the website I'm on. Statista. Statista says there are 6.9 million, you heard me correctly, 6.9 million homes in the United States. Actually, there's more. Yeah. The stat I'm looking at says that's the amount of sales that occurred in the United States for the period of 2020 through 21. That's a lot of houses. That's a lot of houses. 6.9 million. Those are just the ones that sold. That's not all of the houses in the United States. 6.9 million. So you think about 6.9 million. And then you multiply that by, let's just say, I don't know, $53,000. You get a really big number. You get a very big number. A number that starts like in, I don't know, $3 trillion, $36 trillion, I don't know. I can't even, my, my calculator does not have enough zeros to get me to the number I'm trying to convey to you. The point is this. That's a lot of wealth being created in the United States. And that wealth is not being created in the gold market. It's not being created in the silver market. Even though I've seen ad after ad after ad after ad that have said silver is uniquely positioned to double in value. And if it if it just could get back to its all-time high, it would double in value. Okay, that's great. That's great. If you heard the word if in there, right? If listen to those ads when you, when you see them on TV, a lot of ifs in there, a lot, a lot of guys with, you know, name recognition doing those ads, right? They're out there. And, and you, you look at those guys and go, Oh, that guy wrote a book. Oh, that guy wrote a book too. Oh, that guy's financial services guy. Oh, that guy is a rich dad guy, whatever, whatever. Right? So you, you, you accept the fact that because these paid spokesmen, went on to this advertisement and told you that's what you ought to do. It's a sure thing, right? It's not, it's not. And just think if silver, the, the, the catchphrase that just gets me, if silver could only return to its all time high, I'm not sure that's exactly how they phrase it. What that means is that the price of silver 
needs to double in value. It also means there's, there's a lot of things that have to happen to create the value of silver going up. You understand that, right? You understand that silver is actually a commodity. It is actually a metal that is mined out of the ground. It's also recycled out of, out of stuff. And the price of silver right now reflects the availability of silver in the world. It does. It reflects the availability of silver in the world. If you want silver, it costs you a certain price today to get it. What that means is that over time, the price of silver has come down. It had to have come down if it's supposed to double to get back to its all-time high, right? That tells me it's come down. If it's going to double to get back to its, it's, it's come down at least 50%, right? You've lost 50% of value over time in silver for it to get to its price right now. So what's going to happen to silver to make it double in value? Well, there has to be demand for silver. Yeah, that's, that's the way the markets work. Silver just doesn't go up in price because, you know, all of a sudden the, the, the guys that mine silver go, I think we're doubling the price today just because I have, I have a whim. No, that's not the way it works. That's the way, the way any of these commodities markets work. There's, there's all kinds of buying and selling systems that, that go on between from the point where it's pulled out of the ground to the point where it goes into your portfolio. And it probably isn't even in your portfolio. You probably just have a piece of paper that says that you own a portion of it. Okay, I, I realize there are firms that will send you your silver too. I understand that. I get that. Take a look at what that costs too. I'm just saying. But silver. If silver is going to go up in value, then there's got to be a lot of demand for silver. And I'll tell you, everything that I am seeing in the news, I mean, all the all the, the future endeavors, all the things that the White House is, is saying that we require in this country, I don't necessarily know that it's going to drive the requirement for silver. I'm serious. I, I don't know that. I also don't know whether or not any of these things the White House wants to do will even come to fruition because that's kind of the way the government works, right? You get one party gets in power. They want to do things their way. The other party is like, no, we don't like your way. And they you get a lot of pushback and it doesn't matter who's in power. It really doesn't matter. I don't care if you like the previous administration. I don't care if you like the current administration. I don't care if you don't like either administration. I don't care. What you have to accept though, is the fact that this country operates that way and it's the way we're going to do business. What's going to cause silver to double in value? I have no idea. I have absolutely no idea. Other than the fact demand has to go up, which means that there has to be some kind of product or service, probably not a service, most likely a product, some kind of product that will be created that will utilize silver that will be in such demand that it's going to drive the price of silver up and silver is not going to go up dramatically overnight it's not just look at a stock chart of what silver does it's a very slow moving gradually moving thing that's just the way silver is but real estate I can tell you exactly what caused real estate to do what Zillow said. Demand. It was, it was totally, it was, it was 100% demand. I mean, look, look at what we experienced the last two years. You were stuck in your house. I was stuck in my house. We were allowed to do things as essential workers if we qualified to be an essential worker. I, I didn't qualify to be an essential worker. No, but, but fortunately, what I do, I'm, a, I'm able to do for my house. So it didn't really impact me too much. But demand. There was demand for housing in this country. It never stopped. Because we went into a pandemic, what kind of stopped was people moving about the country, like changing from one crib to another. Hey, I threw that crib word in there. You like, yeah, okay. I'll go back to talking like a regular person. Anyway, at the end of the day, everybody, 
everybody in this nation, with the exception of, of people that are homeless, everybody desired a place to live. Oh, and by the way, some of that homeless population, that population also desires a place to live. Just because people are homeless doesn't mean they desire to be homeless. Some people are homeless due to circumstances beyond their control. And I understand that. So you think about it. Out of every 100 people in this country, I would say easily 98 of them desired to have clean, functional, safe housing. Now, some of them, they required workforce housing. Some of them required luxury housing. Some of them required efficiency housing. Some of them, well, they required something else. It didn't matter what they required. The demand was there. And I'm telling you this, the demand is not going away. It's increasing, but the supply isn't. Oh, economics are in play. We come back from the break. More on this. Stick around. Welcome back to the Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show. It's time to turn up the volume and fine-tune your passive income plan so you can create the lifestyle you've always wanted. Welcome back to the show. All right, so I'm, I'm using an Excel spreadsheet right now, and I can't even get the Excel spreadsheet to print out all the ridiculous numbers I was trying to share with you in the last segment. You know, when I said that there was 6.9 million homes that transacted last year, and if all of those homes went up, let's just say $53,000 in, in that one year, that's a really, really big number. Okay, so for, for all you engineers out there, I'll just give you the scientific um, nomenclature so that you understand what it is. 3.657E plus 12. So there's like, what, 12 zeros out there on top of this thing? Yeah, so we're in the, what, millions, billions, we're, we're in the crazy amount of wealth being created in the real estate world. It's affecting me. It's affecting you. It is affecting everybody in this country. Trust me, it is affecting everybody in this country, whether you own your home, whether you rent your home, you are affected by the fact that real estate prices are going up. Now, let me get back to that conversation that I had with Andy Webb. So we were just kind of catching up and I said, Hey Andy, how many, how many houses are you up to right now? And he says, um, 16. And I said, all right, how much, uh, how much debt equity do you have in these houses, Andy? And he said, oh, Al, why would you ask me a question like that? And I said, because I'm the guy that asks all those questions that nobody wants to answer. So do you have debt equity in those houses, Andy? And he said, yeah, I actually do have some debt equity in those houses. Now, debt equity, Let's let's talk about what that is before I continue the conversation that I had with, with Andy. So debt equity is equity that you own in a property. When, when we go out and acquire a property, one of the things that we attempt to do, and we do it very well, is we capture equity. In other words, we buy the house, we renovate it, we put it back into service at wholesale pricing, yet the property is valued at retail pricing, and we take out our permanent financing at the retail price point. So the difference between that retail price point and that all-in cost at our wholesale price point, that's the equity that we capture in a deal. So we always want to go into a deal trying to capture that equity because it gives us additional wealth, additional equity to work with in that asset. It's one of the reasons that we do real estate the way that we do that. That's why we go out and we find 
distressed properties that need to be brought back to life because most people aren't interested in doing that. They, they aren't. Now, some people will do that. Some people will buy it, live in it, fix it up while they live there. Th that's not investing. That's buying a house and fixing it up while you live there. It's not investing. Investing is going and finding that asset, fixing it up, putting it into service as clean, functional workforce housing for a demographic of people that is looking for a great place to live. And that's what we provide people. And we provide them a great place to live. Life, now, let me be, be very clear. Lifestyles Unlimited doesn't do any of that providing anybody a place to live. No. It's the members of Lifestyles Unlimited that do all of that. Lifestyles Unlimited is, is a real estate education and mentoring firm. That's what we do. And we do that for our members, exclusively for our members. And I'll tell you what, we get our members retired in five years or less. So let's get back to Andy and his debt equity. Andy, every year, takes a look at his houses and he makes a determination. First of all, the first thing that he does is he makes contact with his residents about 45 days before the end of the lease period, just to get a sensing for whether or not they're going to be interested in staying in that home for another year. If they are, then they'll talk about renewing the lease. Now, part of those conversations usually includes increasing the rent. Now, most renters don't want to see their rent go up. They, they don't. They, they, want, they want that rent to stay the same, right? Okay. The problem is this. The taxing entities and the insurance entities, they usually don't keep their prices fixed. They usually increase their pricing annually. So as a result, the cost to operate these properties goes up. So what Andy does is he figures out, okay, what is it going to cost to potentially this property to go up? And then what am I going to offer the existing resident as a rent price if they want to stay? So he'll come up with that number and he'll go, okay, well, here's what I'm going to do. Your rent was X, but now I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to take it to Y because it's, I'm, I'm in business. Okay. Uh, but I'm giving you exclusivity. You get to decide whether or not you want to do that or not. If you don't want to do that, it's totally fine. We'll, we'll allow you to leave the property at the end of the lease and we'll find another resident. If you want to stay there, not a problem, not a problem. We'll just renew the lease and we'll continue on. And that gets me to my point. Do you see how everybody is affected by values going up. Yeah. Oh, you missed that part. Oh, let me take you back. All right. Property taxes. Property taxes are usually assessed, at least in Texas. Okay, now the other parts of the country, they're, they do it a little bit differently in different parts of the country. So you got to understand how, where your properties are at, how they analyze and determine what your property taxes will be. In the state of Texas, the assessor assesses the value of your property, and they, they use whatever criteria they can find to create that assessment data, and then they assess your taxes based on that valuation. The assessors routinely will push valuations up. Now, in the state of Texas, you do have the right to protest your taxes, and if you're not protesting your taxes on your residential properties, you're doing this real estate stuff wrong. Protest your taxes. You, you need to do that. Trust me. You will, you will be a better steward of the money you don't give to the government than the government will be of the money that you would otherwise let them have. That's Al's opinion, and I'm sticking to it. Insurance also tends to adjust upward. Very, very rarely have I seen my insurance rates go down. Very rarely. And, and when they do go down, it's usually because I did something to adjust the policy. Yeah, maybe I took, took a coverage off I didn't need, or maybe I reduced liabilities or whatever I did. Okay. Those are really the only ways to make the, the price of insurance go down. 
and usually I'm not adjusting my coverages. My coverages are the way they need to be because they give me the right level of protection against the perils that I'm mostly concerned about. Those two costs right there are a fundamental cost to investing in real estate, to have a piece of real estate as one of your assets in your portfolio. Those costs will go up. You've got two choices. You can either absorb the costs, which is going to result in your cash flow reducing, not very smart, just, just being clear with you, or you can go ahead and pass some of those costs on, some of them, all of them, all of them and a little bit more. It really depends on what the market is indicating to you, you can charge for that property. That's true. It's true. So let me let me give you an example of what I was doing. Now we just we just sold a house. It just closed escrow last week, and we we did very well on this property. This is a property that we bought 15 months ago. We um, we had sold another property. We did a 1031 exchange. We moved all of the equities into this particular property. It was all tax deferred, which meant I didn't owe the United States government any money on that transaction because the government said I could defer those taxes onto this follow-on property. We just sold this follow-on property. We sold it closed escrow last Friday. Tina and I put about 100. 112,000, what is, I don't know, call, just call it 112,000, a little more than that. We put $112,000 back into our coffers. We did not, we did not do a 1031 exchange. We chose not to. And we're going to be liable for the taxes that are going to come due, not only on the gain of the sale of this particular property, but also the tax liability that, fell back to the original property that we sold that started this whole 1031 chain of events. So you're probably thinking, well, that was dumb, Al. You're going to get hammered by taxes. You, you, so you, you did something to defer the taxes so that you could use all your money, but then you got to a place where you're not deferring it anymore. So you're going to get hammered. Well, no, I'm not, because the assets that I'm buying give me all kinds of crazy depreciation that's going to offset those gains. Look, we're going to teach you how to do all this. Go to lifestylesunlimitedworkshop.com. The Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show is for entertainment purposes only. Please consult a professional regarding your personal investment needs. Nothing presented on the Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show constitutes an endorsement recommendation, offer, or solicitation to buy or sell any product or security.